So today we are going to be talking about digital marketing. Uh, and specifically today, we're reaching out to digital marketing newbies. Interestingly enough, I had a, some great conversations this week with CEOs. Uh, and it's interesting how CEOs often uh, won't admit it, but they're digital marketing newbies for the most part. And in, <laughs> in fact, it's, it's hard as a CEO uh, to understand everything in your whole business from how the roof works and how different pieces fit together, as well as digital marketing. Uh, and to understand where your money's going and how you should be spending it, this is probably a very relevant webinar for you if you're here as a CEO or anybody else. Now, digital marketing, what is it? I want to talk about the concept of what digital marketing is before we get into the specifics because, you know, you don't need to learn how to click a button. There's lots of YouTube videos out there, but you do need to understand why. Why would we spend time and money on digital marketing? So there have been four major communications revolutions over the last hundreds of years. Uh, the first was the ability to take information and, and repeat it. So the printing press, obviously the Gutenberg Bible, and the ability to, to you know, give that out to a lot of different people. Then this amazing technology came up where we could communicate over long distances, over oceans, in fact, using one person to one person uh, using a telephone. And then later, we had the ability to record that information and play it back later. And even later after that, the ability to send images through magically or, and sounds through the air to somewhere else. But what's interesting about all of those different technologies is they're all unidirectional. That is... I have a message and I'm going to tell you what the message is. And that's a really important distinction, a really important understanding uh, because everything that we used to do around marketing, around trying to convince people to do stuff was about crafting a message and telling them what to do. And in fact, that's what advertising is. That's why we used to be advertising agencies and we're not advertising agencies anymore because advertising was about manipulating people's thoughts encouraging, persuading them to, to, to take action on something. And, and the idea here is, is that every potential client or customer of yours goes through a natural process. And this is, this is sort of a universal concept. First is, we, they need to know we exist. Now that could happen by just having a plane and dropping paper out of the air so people are aware that you are there. Once somebody knows that you're there, they need to go and have an experience. They need to understand it. They want to do research on it. And then eventually, if they have a great experience, then they develop a preference towards it. And if they have a preference towards it, they'll like it, and then they'll buy it, and then they'll have a future relationship with it. I, I'm going to come back and talk about that a lot more today. Uh, what's, what's interesting, though, is, is that in 2020, people don't believe in advertising anymore. I, I'm sure you already accept that the last time you bought something and saw it, uh, and you actually took it out of the box, you go, wait a second, that's not what I expected. That's not what happened. Uh, we, you, you travel somewhere uh, and, the, and the brochure tells you it's gonna be one way and when you actually get there, it's not what you expected. Nobody, nobody likes that. Uh, there's, there's this, in fact, uh, this was fun. So yesterday, my children and I, uh, we, we went out for lunch and, and we, we decided we we're gonna have a burger off. We went to a w Burger King and McDonald's and bought their best burgers. And we all put them on a table and we compared which one was the best. In fact, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even think about this, but the A&W matzo burger is larger than the Big Mac. In my head, the Big Mac is the size of a train, right? Why is that? Is because I have this mental perception of what is actually wax. What you see there in that picture, which is the mental thing you conjure up before you bite into your not looking like that Big Mac, is in fact made out of wax. But we have been convinced that that thing is a Big Mac and therefore we believe that. And this is the thing is so this, our, our brains are built in such a way that there's, there's actually three different pieces that have sort of grown over, over evolution. We have a little tiny piece of the brain, size of a golf ball at the back, which is the reptilian, reptilian brain. And that, that makes us make decisions really quickly. Then we have the uh, mammalian brain, which go around that, which controls emotions and that thing can do a little bit more intelligent things like decide that last time I was on a log, uh, I got attacked by a snake, so I'm not going to go across that log anymore. And then we developed a, a, the latest brain, which humans have, which has the ability to have existentialist thought, uh, worry about, uh, you know, what's going to happen in the afterlife and, and other sort of random things, as well as better understanding. But what's interesting is all advertising did is try to communicate to the reptilian brain. That is, scare people into doing something, convince somebody that, somebody that they should be somewhere else to be happy, 
I'll leave the next one alone, uh, or d d convince us that if we were at home doing nothing, we'd actually be happier, which is definitely not true, or if we had more stuff or um, access to more food, we'd be happier. So advertising, trying to convince us that we should do that. And in fact, the way advertising worked was we're going to just try and get you to see our message as many times as possible. And because of that, more and more people had messages coming at our brains. And then today, it doesn't matter. We can see things. I'm not sure if anyone who has kids out there knows that in the first few years of having a child, they don't have any scar tissue and they don't have any understanding, they don't have any cynicism built yet. And so they see an ad and they're like, oh my goodness, I love this. And what my child, child ran into, into my... Um, uh, kitchen one day and, and said, I know exactly what shampoo I should buy. Yeah, that, that, that's ridiculous. That is not true. Advertisements are not true. What's changed is this whole idea that we can no longer encourage or manipulate people's thoughts through telling them a message. Now, we have to watch what they're communicating about. We have to inform them. We have to give them information and allow them to make a decision. And what's changed is instead of trying to communicate with the reptilian brain, we're now advancing that to have conversations with the mammalian brain and the, and the latest brain, the, the, the thing that makes us truly human. And that, in fact, is what digital marketing is all about. It's about not just crafting a message and slamming it down somebody's throat, but about informing and getting involved in conversations. Now, at the bottom of, of digital marketing, at the bottom of marketing itself, is trying to figure out who and what we should be communicating with. Ultimately, we have limited time, money, uh, and energy, and we need to figure out where we're gonna put that limited time, energy, and money to get the best value for our buck, the shortest distance between here, where I'm standing today, and either the most amount of money, the most success, the, the most of whatever it is that I'm looking for. So what happens is, is people go, you know what? I'm going to find one message or one marketing uh, channel. We get this all the time. So people come to us and say, look, I'm going to take out, I had literally this week, somebody said, I'm going to go on one radio station for one week and I'm going to blitz it and that's going to work great. No, 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 it's not. That's not how marketing works. Marketing is about a whole bunch of repetitive little tiny levers pulled in the right order, sometimes different times, all sorts of different things, all these different levers all being pulled in different ways. And different people respond to different stimuli, therefore different levers are going to affect different people. So what are the highest and best value actionable activities that I can do to get my audience to the, to the result that I want them to be at? Now, what we do in the marketing world is we start off by trying to group people into sort of mentally, logistically uh, relevant groups. In fact, the word in our world is called personas, buyer personas, brand personas, et cetera. So what we do is we group those personas, those groups of people, we figure out who are they? What are the kinds of people that we're trying to sell to? What questions are they asking? What information are they asking? What are they trying to, they're trying to sort of figure it out for themselves so they're trying to find, in, find ideas. They're trying to see what their peers had to say. Now, we want to understand how much money they have. Are we going after the right group? So we really want to think through what that group looks like. Uh, and in fact, we put a lot of energy at the beginning of any initiative and you're trying to figure out exactly what the person would be like, what that person act, would act like, what their goals are like, uh, what their personality traits are, et cetera. And then once we've figured out what that persona profile looks like, then we try and figure out what's the most, the most likely path between them starting and finding out that we exist all the way through to the purchase moment and after that. Now we can figure out very simply uh, from a background of obviousness, what is it that they'd like to hear? How is it they'd like to hear it? What is it that we like to say? And we can be intentional about this instead of haphazard about this. Once we figured out what the personas are, we figured out the messaging framework, then we can figure out what is the process they're gonna go through. Some people, we, you know, we wanna hire people, we wanna buy, have people buy from us, et cetera. So there's all sorts of pieces. Then we gotta figure out what watering holes are they drinking at? So where are the channels, where are the places that they are already? And then we've gotta figure out how much it's gonna cost us to be in each one of those areas. And then we've gotta figure out how much we're gonna, we wanna spend and how much they're willing, how much value they're gonna bring us. And if we could figure that out, once we have this machine working, and we can crank that sucker and make lots of money. It's as simple as that. 
So we start with those per personas and we try and figure out as many as possible. And obviously we're trying to get them to an action. Typically that action is buy. It might be uh, the action of, of applying for work. It might be the action of uh, asking for tech support, but whatever that action is, we've got to figure out what the marketing goal is. There's also though, and we got to really not forget this, not just getting somebody to buy or getting somebody to buy is not sufficient. We actually need to manage the relationship way past that. The experience that people have afterwards is just as important as the experience people have up until the purchase moment. Uh, we have a client we're working with. I literally just got a text from, should turn off my phone. Um, and uh, our client is doing uh, one and a half million a month now through their website, but almost all of it is one-time purchasing. And they've done an amazing job at the very beginning of the funnel, getting people to it and the growth and because of COVID. And what, where we're failing now, uh, what we need to fix is the experience afterwards. We need them to buy more from us afterwards. We need to have a, a understand how their return policy works and how all those pieces happen afterwards so that they become an advocate for us and tell other people that they should buy from us. So, and we go back to this idea, we've got all these different channels, all these different places that we could potentially do marketing. Now, those channels are so wide. I mean, we're talking billboards and shop signage and uh, networking through business clubs and, and testimonials through PR and videos and blimps. I mean, there's so many different ideas and things that we can do from a marketing perspective. Now, I want to talk quickly, though, about uh, a little, little higher level about the different hypotheses that we need to have or, or the di different models at the bottom of all marketing. One is our goal may be just to get people to buy from our website. If we, for example, have an e-commerce or a B2C, that's business to consumer, our goal is to get everybody to our website so that they can purchase uh, because that's where the purchase happens typically. So all of the marketing activities that we have wants to go back towards the central goal. Alternatively, we might want to look at the customer. In fact, maybe they might not buy on our website. Maybe they could buy through Instagram. Maybe they could buy through Pinterest. Maybe they could do something else. So looking at an omni-channel hypothesis is how are the different pieces going to fit together that will eventually trigger my, my client, hopefully eventually advocate to make, to take action. But we're going to concentrate on this hub and spoke hypothesis. There's so many different things that obviously we could use to drive traffic back to a central point back to an action that they could take, be it purchase or fill out a form or whatever that is. And what's, what's, what's interesting is, is that there are a core group that are not about telemarketing. They are about information and involvement. Uh, and that is, at the, that is foundationally is what digital marketing is. Uh, and so today we're gonna talk about digital marketing and what are the core pillars of digital marketing. Now. This is the most important part. And so if you're gonna leave the webinar in the next minute, you need to hear this first. And that is that these activities support one another. These activities can be done in a, all by themselves, one at a time. You can go to a company that just does SEO. You can go to a company that just does pay-per-click. You can go to a company that just does social media. But unless you have a unified strategy, pulling them all together where they all work together as one, you're gonna spend more money for less, for less success. So let's talk about what each one of these things are, mutual supporting activities. Actually, before we get into that, I just gotta stop. In order to be successful at digital marketing, you do need two things in play. The first thing that you need in play is you need to go watch our webinar on branding, talking about emotional connection. Uh, if, you, if you want it, Taylor will send it to you. Branding is not just your logo for the record. It's the whole thing. It's, the, it's how people feel about the business. It's how, it's how we've interacted with the business. It's the messaging. It's the tone. It's the way other people communicate about us. It's all of the other things put together. Uh, in fact, our, uh, in, our, in our branding seminar, we're talking about bottles. Uh, and I have the bottle from that very webinar right here. The water's probably not drinkable anymore. Uh, but that, the idea that water is more expensive this bottle of water dasani is more expensive than gasoline uh in terms of its its milliliter value and yet it's actually tap water uh which is obviously much less value than that you're paying for brand you're paying for the feeling that it conjures up and and all those things so your story your image your typography all those things and your brand standards we got, i could talk about that for a, a long time but at the bottom of this 
you need to have that strength in your brand. You also need, so you can watch this webinar, I think this was last week, a strong website. And of, of course, depending on what kind of business you are, if you're a B2C, so business to consumer, which is you're selling stuff right online, or if you're business to business where people need to come find proof that you are great, or if you are doing uh, working with distributors, so you want their orders to happen, you want simplicity, et cetera. Uh, we're talking about ERPs next week. If you want to come back, that's pretty fun. Uh, but bottom line is depending on what kind of business you are, depending on what kind of platform you're running, uh, you need to have that in play in order for digital marketing to work. And the stuff that you gotta know about website building, you gotta make sure you have the, a, a great architecture that when we're dropping people in through social media onto side pages and other things, that the whole thing works brilliantly together. That when people land on your site, it, the, the feeling of the actual brand on your website comes across so they understand that in fact you are a specific thing. And of course, uh, you wanna make sure that your that the brand the feeling isn't just a logo on it so that will depend on how it is and how you build your website and honestly i could talk about that for hours so i won't i'm just gonna say this last piece which is in order for your digital marketing to be successful first you got to make sure your brand is under control then you got to make sure your website's under control and then we can go be successful with our digital marketing activities the first and most important activity in digital marketing is content so what is content? In fact, this concept uh, we refer to in the world as uh, content marketing. So content marketing, and it's back to that same idea, is that traditional marketing is, is intrusive. It's about getting a message and beating you over the head with that message. Content marketing is about creating valuable information and sharing that valuable information with other people. And that's, again, it's not messaging, it's not telling somebody something, it's, it's helping somebody understand something that they previously didn't understand. Now, content isn't necessarily a blog. It can be a blog. So content, as in text content, is something. But in fact, there's lots of other forms of content. You can have video content. You can have imagery content. You can have a, a, a job posting is content. Like everything, every form of content is something different. And also, I can go down a whole philosophical rabbit hole here. I was sort of there last night and deleted all these slides. Marshall McLuhan, the great Canadian, and his ideas around how the medium itself is and possibly can be the message itself. But we're going to skip that and just say, look, when you're thinking about your strategy around content, it can't just be text. It should be holistic. But when it comes to the content itself, there's a lot of different pieces in how you can build it. So you start off with building just marketing content about yourself, why we're here, why we do that. Then you build why we're great. So that's bios, testimonials, case studies. Then you build around that expertise content, become the expert, become the, the subject matter expert in your space. Uh, around that, you build evergreen content, stuff that's gonna stick around forever, You know, definitions, listings, glossaries. Around that, you build blogs, opinion content. Around that, you build uh, PR. You get to go out there on external stuff. You get other people to talk about you. And of course, there's an infinite number of other things you could do. Put articles, write articles, put them on other people's websites, stick stuff on different channels. Now, what's interesting is you need to think about how you're going to expend your energy because maybe Troy could do this because he's like a one-man machine of content generation. Zoe writes content like you would not believe. Taylor's constantly creating content. I just can't keep up with all of these things. So I gotta have a plan. Not only that, is it's not just about planning, it's actually about the, the, I call it the asset value, so how long the content's gonna last. Some of that content, you send out a tweet and it's gone. So your energy has a very short li uh, shelf life. Uh, when you talk about the shelf life of stay expertise content or why we do things in kindergarten, literally it can last decades, decades. So you've got to balance how much energy you're going to put into stuff that it's only going to last 10 seconds and stuff that's going to last decades. Uh, and in, in terms of what that content is and how you're educating people, honestly, there's an infinite number of things. Uh, you'll get a copy of this presentation, presumably. Uh, and so if you want some ideas, you feel free to use them. Uh, it's not just about that, though. It's, it, it's also about, if you go back to that theory of how does our funnel work, you really got to think hard about how and what types of content the people that we're trying to communicate with want. So you, you know, I, I, I have close members of my family who uh, 
create an insane amount of content that genuinely nobody wants to read. That doesn't, that doesn't help anybody. So you need, when you're doing your planning around what kind of content there is, you've got to consider what are people interested in uh, and are they my clients? What are my clients or potential clients interested in hearing about? And then going creating content around that. When you do that, and this is one of the things TreeFrog does for our clients, is you need to create a plan. That plan is as simple as a content calendar, which is actually figuring out exactly what you're going to write any given day, what types of content you're going to do, and then stockpile that content. So you write a piece of content, you do not, if it's evergreen, you don't need to send it out that day. You can actually plan to put it out in the future. So stockpiling that stuff, and, and then you can create content around seasons. So obviously during Christmas, you write Christmas content. In other parts of other times, you put different kinds of content out. So that content calendar piece, that thinking about how it's gonna work, that's important. When you're actually doing the content writing itself, you also need to consider, we're gonna talk about this more, uh, keywords. So you need to consider what are the different keywords that you have uh, as part of what you're gonna write. So you're not just writing haphazardly, you're actually writing really, really strategically so that everything that you write has value. Once you've figured out what those right keywords are, then you can optimize the content, you can make sure that content works great. You can even go through past content, tweak it up a bit uh, for new keywords and new concepts. Uh, so content is never dead, it's just evolving. So think about your, the evolution of what that content looks like on your website. So some tips uh, for the people who are brand new at this. One is it, content can be about writing, building, creating. It can also be about curating. It can also be about finding other people's content and putting that out there. And that can be as valuable, if not more valuable than creating the content yourself. Having a plan is really important. If you don't have a plan, you're, you know, you, that is your plan and it sucks. Uh, and, and also the idea that uh, you need to do something, creating something like a minimum of one blog post a month. So in our, when we start with working with clients, we say, look, you, you can't do less than a blog post a month if you want to keep the, keep the thing spinning. And then posting on your website and not doing any external marketing. So if you do all this content creation and then you don't do any other marketing, you're going to fail. You're going to have zero success because as much as, you know, your content might be great, uh, if you can't get people to read it, it's not going to work out for you. So that's actually comes down to how do we get people to read your content after you've created it? Let's start off with number one. So we've talked about content marketing. The next major pillar here is SEO. So every SEO engineer in the world will kill me for telling you these secrets. Uh, in fact, every SEO engineer I've ever talked to is like this, you're explaining it wrong. This doesn't work that this way. And, and I'm like, dude, I've been doing this for 25 years. This is how it works. So here's the deal. When you go to Google and type something in, there is a list of things that come up with pretty much, pretty sure everybody, if you've made it this far to this webinar, you know that that is the case. So here's the thing, whoever's at the top is more likely to get clicked on, not only more likely to get clicked on, but people have an innate belief that the number one thing on Google is actually the best product or service relating to that thing, which is not real at all, that it's whoever hired the best SEO company, specifically whoever hired TreeFrog. Um, that's who's gonna have the perception of having the best product. Uh, now, it's, 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 the question is how do I fight that? And here's how this thing works. So every website has phrases uh, inside them. So let's say we use the phrase, uh, web design. Uh, so TreeFrog does web design. We want to win web design. We want to win it locally because we kind of like working with local businesses, but we don't really care. So we want to win web design anywhere we possibly can. Wherever the phrase web design appears on our website, Google comes through and gives us some points for that. So if it's in the title of the page, they give us uh, some points for the title on the first page, they give us some extra points. If it's in the title of the URL bar, they give us some points. If it's in the first paragraph, they give us some points. If it's six times on the page, they give us some points. They give us more points. If there's if it's more than 22 times on a page, they give us less points. And there's the whole plus and minus points system, uh, which is referred to as the Google algorithm. And in fact, all of these positive influence and all these negative influence things can happen in order to make you number one on Google. Whoever has the most points wins the game. That's how the game works. 
And what's interesting is we'll get back to this later is how social media and all, all there's all sorts of external factors as well that drive this up. So SEO engineering is a lot of shaking the magic rattle, which is the sort of shamanistic attitude, which I'm going to go in and I'm going to do fancy stuff that it's very difficult to explain to anybody in order to make it rain. Right. There is actually pretty straightforward stuff. We follow some obvious checklists. There are bad things that you can do called black hat things. For example, my favorite is cloaking. That's when you take the phrase and you, you have a white background on your website and you put white text so nobody can see it. And you put the phrase like 50 times in the white text on your page. Oh man, we figured that one out earlier. We had some great success. Uh, that's, that's bad. Thing. Don't do that. Don't do that for the matter. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that at all. Uh, you need to know what Google thinks are bad things and good things if you're going to do SEO engineering on your own. That, that, that's a simple fact. But here's the thing. SEO engineering for SEO engineering's sake, this whole doing all of these little tiny things, trying to drive that thing up, that's not the point. The point is, the point is Google is whenever you go to Google, they're trying to get the best answer to the person who's searching. That's actually what makes Google more successful than everybody else is that they do the best job of getting the best result to the top of the page. So they actually sell relevance. They sell that idea that they're, they're your, the best possible thing is going to be there. And lots of search engines have died over that issue. If you are the most credible result, if you have the best content, the best information for people who are actively searching for that thing, then Google's job is to find you. And Thus, you're going to be number one on Google. So what Google's going to do, and every day, literally every day, they change the math on this whole thing. So if all you're going to do is hire engineers, those engineers are going to be running around doing different SEO things. That's not going to work. What you're going to want to do is create great content that's properly put together and post on your website and then do a whole bunch of external things as well. Hence, SEO being a critical part of how this works. Basically, it's as simple as this. Either have the best content, the best credible website you possibly can, or exclusively invest in SEO. What you should do is both. You should have both work together. There's another important thing here, which is if you are going after what we call ego terms like web design, uh, or in this case, farmer's market, you'll see here, you'll see that Google has a lot more possibilities of results for this. What you're looking for is the specificity of what people search for. So in the old days, we used to go at the bottom, there's like a Google with an O and you can click on the O and go to the next page. Remember that? Nobody ever clicked on those, on those O's. It's almost like they didn't work. Because what people will do is you search for something. If you don't find what you're looking for, the human behavior is you search again. So you search again and again and again until you find the thing that you're looking for. And this is a theory called long tail theory. And it's been around tree frog for so long that our logo is four logos old. I love it. So what, what's fascinating here is that, for example, the word design, if I wanted to win that, there's going to be a lot more searches of it, but there's a lot less relevance there for the possibility of having to sell something. In our case, we want to win the web design new market Ontario. We're much more likely to get business off of that. We're going to convert people into taking a proper action. It's going to cost us less to actually win that. So when we actually look at keywords, we start by looking at ego keywords, but there's as many possible wins. There's as many long tail keyword phrases as there are short head phrases, and they're more likely to bring business to us. <clears throat> so that long tail theory is make sure that you've got really the, the more content, the better content, the better phrasing, the better stuff you do. The, we have had clients that we've worked with for 10 years and they dominate in their industry. Absolutely dominate. Why? Because they've had consistent quality content, consistent engineering principles doing positive white hat appropriate things for year after year after year. Ultimately, this is the little secret is behind SEO is content marketing. If you're not doing one and you're only doing the other, you're going to have trouble. Now, with that in mind, we blog, we create content with SEO in mind. And thus, we go through this process. We go through, we create and do keyword research. We figure out what those keywords are. We use those in, in our SEO. We use those in, in our blog posting, et cetera. And that's what drives our business. Uh, there are a whole bunch of tools for doing that research. There's Google Trends. 
SEM Ross and to the public. Uh, and, and the idea here is that you're looking for concepts, uh, clusters of information. So for example, uh, this is this is thanks slide is thanks to Zoe. Uh, you, you start off with the idea of I want to win the words SEO cop copywriting. Around that, there's a whole bunch of other topics that I could write on, like SEO copywriting webinars, uh, like uh, what is SEO, which might be an evergreen, like something that's going to stay on our website for a long time. Uh, some tools that might be a short, shorter lifespan idea. But the idea is we go create topics, clusters of what that content's going to look like, and then we post that in the relevant places at the right time. So, hey, do you have any comments on that? Mm -hmm. So, like Sean said, this topic cluster model is something that HubSpot um, kind of um, did research on and they published a paper about this. Um, but the idea is in order to strengthen your SEO, instead of if you're trying to win a keyword, you're not just going to write one piece of content relating to a keyword. You're going to write a few different ones, a um, few different variations of that topic. And then what you're going to do is you're going to link each of them back. Um, you know, to that service page that you offer on your website, make sure you interlink um, the articles themselves if they are relatable to one another. Um, and in order to do that, that really strengthens your SEO value and helps build the interlinking within your website, which also then strengthens your SEO even further. Um, you do this for a variety of service topics that you might offer for your, um, in your business. And that really helps to build up your SEO value and, you know, using content marketing to kind of strengthen that. Absolutely, exactly. So some quick tips uh, on SEO itself. One is don't try and boil the ocean. Clients come to us and go, I want to take over every possible keyword all at the same time. And what basically happens is, uh, A, you don't, if, if, if you aim at everything, you hit nothing. Uh, so we pick some specific things and, and create a really intelligent strategy around what are we going to go after first? what's the highest and best value things. And then from that, you will start to see long tail benefits and other things. Next thing is you got to know what's going to be successful. So when you see the conversions happening, you write more content around that idea. So if you see that this concept is gaining you business and this concept isn't, then you start driving one or the other. And that's where that start at the top thing matters. Start with the most valuable keywords that you possibly can find and work down from there. Lastly, is make sure you do the right thing. So what I mean by that is, I, I could get you to number one on Google in a very short period of time, but it would be very, very short lived and you'd have permanent damage to your website as a result. You wanna do it ethically, you wanna do it correctly with your white hat on. And one of, the, one of the dangers is people hire companies, sort of fly-by-night companies who figured out a real a trick to make it happen. My favorite one is you buy a competitor's website or you build an external website or a company that's gone bankrupt, buy their website and take all the links on their website and point them at yourself. That will have amazing short-term value and really not great long-term value. Okay, let's move on and let's talk, that was talking about SEO. So that is on-page work or on your website work, it's organic stuff. You're doing your, all sorts of activities to try and drive your ranking up on Google. But there's a second thing you can do though. Uh, and what this is, is instead of trying to rank organically on Google, you could actually pay for it. Obviously you can pay Google, it's called search engine marketing or pay-per-click PPC or AdWords is the name of Google's uh, uh, mechanism around this. So what you'll see is if you type in, for example, digital marketing, new market, you'll see that you will get our ad number one, and then you'll get a bunch more ads from other companies who also want to win that uh, before you see any organic stuff. So what, what's interesting about this is, is that there's a lot of work that needs to go into how you're going to spend your money. You could, and what people often do is they take a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks and they go to Google and they sort of throw it at Google and say, hopefully it works. But what's interesting is if you do that, you'll get some effect, but you will not get a great effect. What you really want to do is make sure that the money that you're spending is really, really well thought out, really, really well monitored. Keywords can cost up to $54 a click. Uh, in fact, usually they're in the sort of dollar range, dollar to five dollar range, uh, and it can go as little as 10 cents if nobody wants them. And there's a whole bunch of things that you need to do to figure out what are the things that are getting people towards your website. And so unless you're monitoring and really looking after this and really thinking about it well, you are literally just wasting your money. 
Now, how this works, you're doing keyword research, you're writing all the ads, you're building the landing pages, you're setting up the campaigns, and you're tracking and testing. So there is a process to how this works. Uh, now, again, figure out where your, advert, your audience is, figure out what your budget's going to be, and then figure out how an, you're going to use creative, whether you're going to use text ads or whether you're going to use imagery or how you're going to put those together, how you're going to balance that. And it's interesting, if your budget is very low, we'll often do a very specific thing. If you want to spend an infinite amount of money, we'd still say, look, we'll start with this, experiment this way when you figure out what works, do that. Otherwise, you can spend a lot of money and get the wrong things in the door. Uh, what's also very interesting, and this, this is, I think, critical that everybody understands, is, is that depending on the quality of, of the ad itself, and that's there's a whole bunch of things that build that quality score, you're going to pay more or less as your competitor for the same keyword. So where an advertiser could be paying $8 for a click, you could be paying $2 and you're more likely to be in number one position as you saw with us uh, because you actually have relevant content, do relevant stuff, have all the other pieces set up and everything works. So your cost per click actually goes down depending on how good your website is. And in fact, on how good the content is, how good the ads are, you can actually reduce the cost of how much you're spending with Google and Google AdWords by having great ads and having a great landing page and a great website and a great infrastructure around that. In fact, you could pay 80% less than your competitor for the same thing. That's critical because if you're thinking about just doing AdWords, clients come to us and say, look, I've only got this budget, so I'm only gonna put money into AdWords. Look, unless you're spending a certain amount of money and unless you have all the other stuff, a great website and you know, well thought out, you're gonna be paying a whole bunch of money for something that you're not, you're not gonna get value. And in fact, your competitor who's done all the other activities, they're gonna be paying a lot less for the same thing. So you actually have to make more money off your sale in order to achieve the same results. So that landing page relevance, you can see how all this stuff starts to fit together again. SEM, PPC fits together with SEO, which fits together with content. Now we get into social media. So social media, I, I could talk about, we could give a whole presentation on this. I'm not gonna go in depth into this because we're gonna run out of time, but there are lots of different watering holes. So there's a lot of things that lots of people are experimenting with, but there are some core, core big five, I'm gonna say big six now, uh, uh, because I'm gonna include TikTok until the United States says no to it. Uh, I, Basically, every form of technology eventually, for example, the printing press, for example, television, gets adopted by everybody. So, and there's a natural process that I'm not gonna talk about it today. Eventually as well, there's sort of a convergence. And at the very beginning of the of web development, all websites were all over the place, they all look different. Now there's conventions that have started to be standardized between everybody. So the way menus work, the way the fact that the logo is almost always in the top left hand corner and if you click it it takes you to the home page there's some basic concepts like that that have now started to appear in social media so most social media platforms have started to operate i'm going to say in a similar fashion what hasn't changed though is the continuing growth and usage of social media so when we're talking about that uh, advertising idea where we're changing to who's communicating who's out there having these conversations more and more people are having more and more conversations on more and more platforms. Uh, and, and that's fascinating. So what's changed is where we used to use cold calling as a mechanism uh, to, to gain sales, to increase our business. Now we need to change that mentality where we're going to call people and hammer them over the head to we are going to create meaningful relationships with people and, and build our reputation with them and show them that we are in fact the right answer to the question. So why, this, this also speaks to social media in general. So I'm not gonna go into specific platforms and talk about those things. We actually have webinars on platforms. If, you wanna, if you're interested in a specific platform like Facebook or LinkedIn for a specific goal, call us, talk to us, and we'll help you out. But what's interesting here is social media connects back to search engines, connects back to the rest of our digital marketing stuff. So our, our content marketing, our SEO, actually support and drive our social media activities. So if we have, we create a great blog post, we can now use that and we can drip it out over various platforms over periods of time, which then increases our SEO, which drives everything. So everything sort of naturally grows in a meaningful way. Uh, so 
what, what's important is, is that bigger idea that this as part of digital marketing, social media doing it all by itself is not the approach. What, what's also important is when you go back to that idea of who is the person, what is the persona, what is the group of people that we're trying to communicate with, you can figure out pretty quickly which platforms your people are having, your potential clients are having conversations on, and then go have conversations on those platforms. Uh, there's where your success is going to be, obviously, is doing the right thing in the right place. Uh, and lastly, uh, is the, uh, Zoe, did you want to talk to this? Yeah, so going back to the whole hub and spoke model, you know, sharing posts on social media, doing that Facebook Live for, you know, event, that all kind of can be part of your hub and spoke to in order to strengthen, you know, your SEO. So if, you know, we were using this, this example, uh, we we're trying to win the word um, or the phrase Sunday's farmer's market. So obviously we have our blog content, um, you know, 10 family friendly places to visit um, or to eat in Richmond Hill in the summer. And then feeding the blog content, we are sharing the content that we're creating on social media. So these shared posts, us tweeting about it. And then, you know, it, maybe if I'm at the farmer's market that day and doing like a Facebook live or posting photos, um, about the farmer's market, um, then all of that kind of feeds back to the hub and spoke model in order to strengthen us and strengthen that phrase that we're trying to go after as a business. And that all kind of, you know, improves your Google rankings over time. Absolutely. And there's, a, there's some other just quick things I want to touch on. So if you're in our webinar last week, we were talking about e-commerce. There's other things that you can do, like sell directly through e social commerce. Uh, but the, the, the reality is we're, the whole thing serves to support itself. Now, we use some professional tools. Here's some example. We're actually HubSpot partners if you're interested in doing some more creative and more complex things around marketing, as well as using Hootsuite to monitor what's going on uh, and try to figure out what the, what the correct audience is, what better audiences are. So some tips uh, for, for social media. Number one is don't try and boil the ocean again. Uh, try, pick the right channels, pick the most relevant channels and start communicating through those. It is important to sort of put it from a branding perspective to have a basis, you know, everywhere. Uh, but once you get that sort of solid basis, you, you do your core work against the core channels that are going to work. And again, that's figuring out where your audience is and going and specifically communicating to them. I'm also going to say, and I, numbers are the, the, how many followers you have is less important than who is following you. Uh, that, that's sort of mission critical. Uh, you, you've got to figure out, are the followers or, that you're trying to get, you know, you can go buy followers for uh, next to nothing. I have an account with 76,000 followers. I assure you most of them are dead people and people from Azerbaijan. Uh, they are not relevant to uh, my, uh, myself or, or what, what I'm saying. Now, uh, this is also an important concept and I don't want to miss this. Uh, the idea of social media, which is different than casual or classic marketing, is in classic marketing, when I have a, um, uh, a piece of content and I share it, it stops. It stops the person I'm sharing it with. An advertisement, I read it, it's done. Unless it's unbelievably clever, then I might pass it on. Typically it's not. So I read it and I try my best to forget it as quickly as I can. With social media, when I post something and somebody else retweets it, somebody else likes it, somebody else engages with it, their, you, their people will then see that post. And then if somebody from that group clicks, some, uh, likes it, it can be shared with people far outside my group. This is why social media allows us to literally communicate around corners to other people in similar watering holes. That's, that's critical. Because if I was to send an email broadcast to all of my current clients, it stops at them. But if I get them to reshare something on social media, all their clients, all their vendors, all the people communicating with them see it as well, the ones that are involved. <clears throat> and that's how you get, well, I mean, one like on social media is worth, is worth its weight on gold, in gold. What's fascinating though is, is that over the last uh, decade, there has been a, a decline of how many of those, what, what that organic reach looks like. In other words, in the past, when I clicked on something or when I liked something specifically, uh, the number of people who would see that was higher than the number of people that see it today. So it's still critical. We're still getting a percentage of people that see it, but there is actually a decline in 
what that or those postings that I'm putting up get to. And that's how we get into paid social. Now, this is the whole point. This is the whole thing behind Facebook, how they've become obviously so wealthy. Uh, it was when they started, they weren't making any money. They had zero advertisements. They were just trying to get people onto their social platform. Once people were there, then they started to change the algorithm so less people saw those organic posts and put in advertisements ability so you could advertise directly. And this is why you're gonna have to pay your, your dues to Dr. Zuckerberg, uh, make sure he's got some money uh, so he can afford to fend up all the United States issues. So this is classic things. If you're on Facebook and you see ads, there's all sorts of different places where these ads appear and they kind of give this sort of feel like posts. Now, what we do here, same sort of idea, is we, as professionals, we're going to go in, we're going to figure out exactly what audience. Now, even more so than Google, even more than figuring out what are the keywords and what are the sort of demographics that I want to, uh, those keywords to go after, in Facebook, you can pick unbelievably specific groups of people you want to advertise to, and then pick lookalike audiences, groups of audiences similar to those, and get a, get very, very specific uh, in terms of industry, in terms of age, in terms of demographics and lifestyle, et cetera, of uh, the people that you're going to be advertising to. So we've seen uh, a tr tremendous success recently with a social pay-per-click, not just AdWords. We've actually seen, in some cases, significantly better results from social pay-per-click than Google AdWords or other activities. And again, this is supported. So this stuff, you don't just have an ad and show it to somebody. What you do is you use that to get somebody back to a piece of information. And then from that piece of information, you increase the trust that you have with people, your credibility, that fulfills more, you get more SEO because you've got more traffic. I mean, the whole thing starts to work together. And, and ultimately that serves that larger digital marketing goal. So there is a, a complex process in how we go through paid social. I'm not going to go through this because we don't have the time, but uh, you know how we discover, how we figure out what those ads look like, how we're going to get through. If you're interested in talking to somebody at TreeFrog about it, we'd love to talk to you about it. So that's what this whole thing is. That's what this whole webinar has been about, is the idea that there are five pillars to digital marketing. There are some more like email marketing and other things that, we, that are, are, are still around the fringes of digital marketing, but the core things that all serve to support one another if you do just one, you're going to get some success. But if you do all five working together in unison, you're going to start seeing a lot better results. You're going to drive your costs down and you're going to get overall more success out of it. So think about that. So you've got your, your content that you're developing is driving your SEO ranking, which is decreasing the cost of, S, uh, of, your, of your search engine marketing which is allowing you to identify better groups and advertisements for social pay-per-click, which then drives your social media work, which is the content which we are linking through to the content that you're developing. And you get that flywheel going and it starts going in a meaningful way. 